Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Today, college recruiting. Special guests with me today. We're going to talk about the processes, how to get recruited. Do you want to be recruited? Well, you're going to have to watch this. Stay tuned. All right, guys, have you ever wanted to be recruited by a college for your tennis? Have you ever thought about what the processes are? Have you ever, you know, do you have a child that may be coming up towards that process? Well, today is a special day for you because I have from USF, Coach Peter Bartlett here with me. Before I get into Coach Peter Bartlett, let me tell you a little bit about him. So Coach Coach Bartlett here earned his bachelor's degree uh, in Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from the University of Oregon and also minored in business administration. He earned his master's degree from USF Sports Management Program in 1995. As a player, Coach Bartlett's win total in both singles and doubles ranked third on the Ducks' all-time list at the end of his career. He participated in various open and international tennis federation tournaments in the United States and Asia what is basically known as the ITF Tour today. So Coach Bartlett joined the USF Dons back in 1995 when he was hired as an assistant coach of the men's tennis team. Coach Peter was promoted to head the position of head coach in 1997, 98 season, and for the next 16 years, developed the USF men's tennis program into an upper echelon program in the WCC, the Western Con West, the West Coast Conference, the WCC. Going into his 25th season, Peter served as the USF men's tennis coach and now in his fifth season as the women's tennis coach, as well as the director of tennis. So Peter has many hats over there. Uh, Peter mentored multiple national ranked singles and doubles players. Many of the players from his program earned first team all WCC honors. So he is the winningest coach in the history of the University of San Francisco's tennis program. And he is also the longest tenured coach in USF history. Wow, that's a... Uh, at the university. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so as the Dons head coach, the Dons received their highest national ranking of number 58 in 2011, garnered an ITA national ranking 12 times in Coach Peter's 16 years as head coach, including an all-time high of fifth in 2011. Named West Coast Conference Coach of the Year following the 2003 season after leading the Dons to a third place conference finish. So the reason I asked Coach Peter Bartley here today is because he has the unique experience of having to recruit for the men's and the women's side of a college Division One program. So USF, just so you guys know, is a Division One tennis program. So they play at the highest level of college tennis. Um, the University of San Francisco Dons, they play uh, other teams like, you know, Cal Berkeley, Stanford, University of Southern California, and you, you know, UCLA. So some of the highest echelon top programs in America. So who better than to get than Coach Peter here today? 
So recruiting the best players you can get is extremely important. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Coach Peter Bartlett today. Peter, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so first question. Um, how do you recruit? How do you recruit people, kids in general? Well, it's a, it's a process. Um, it's, it's a lengthy process, you know, because obviously as players are being developed as junior tennis players, you're trying to, in a sense, get involved with their teen years mm -hmm. um, and trying to get to know who they are as players and what their ambitions are um, when they want to go to college, obviously. Um, so that process can start, you know, um, early as the sophomore year, um, where you have some form of contact between. Um, you have to wait for certain rules until they become, um, in a sense, after their junior year. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, then you, the process starts to open up a little bit as they're starting into, the, into their senior year. Um, but that's a process that we try to follow with the recruits. Um, as you have seen them at junior tennis tournaments and things like that, but that process, um, you know, is a, it's a list of, in a sense, uh, people that you are gathering and then trying to follow up the best that you can to see if your university matches with their needs. Um, at the same time, selling them on the process of going to college, the level of tennis uh, that we serve them, and the institution that you, in a sense, represent, in my case, USF. Well, so as early as a sophomore year in high school, you are allowed to have some uh, contact with letters and sending stuff out this way. Yes. So basically, you're telling me that these kids got to start playing and being good pretty quickly. They want to start to identify whether they would like to be involved in getting recruited by a college, yes. And obviously there's different tiers, mm -hmm. as in divisions, division one, division two, division three. So yes, you're, you're, you're as a junior tennis player and all the kids are in these academies, in a sense, you're wanting to think a little bit about how they will get identified or you know, what that interest level is. Um, so I would guess that most kids you know, who play tournaments at you know, 12 years old to 13 years old to 14 years old into freshman, sophomore year would want to be recruited. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that I would say, I would agree with that. If they're serious about their tennis and they're, you know, going to the academies or going to their club and training or hitting and, and being committed, then I think that's a great ambition. And like I said, the tennis is served at a lot of different levels in college. So if you can't play Division I, uh, then you can try some Division II. Division Three also is very, you know, it's all valid tennis, and the experiences at all those levels, uh, you know, are extremely fun. Now, do you travel to, like, some of the major tournaments like Orange Bowl, Easter Bowl? Yeah, I, I just got back from the girls' hard courts, which was in San Diego, girls' 16s, 18s. So I just literally flew back yesterday. Oh, wow. Now, that's another process where I might go back down. It depends on the year and how many athletes, in a sense, we're kind of looking to solidify, depending on their graduation years. But that's also pre-identification. So I was watching mainly the 16-year-olds because our needs are closer to the 2022 or 2023, really, is probably when we'll open up a little bit more with um, providing more scholarship funding. Money funding will be available during those years. Oh, so you're, you're basically taking your lineup now and then looking towards the future when they graduate, then you bring in the next crop. Correct. Wow. And that all has to kind of match. So you have to pre-plan how many spots you believe that you have. With the pandemic, this is confused and clogged the system. So what, in, what did we mean by that is that every girl that was during the pandemic has been given one extra year of eligibility. So she can become a graduate student and still have her eligibility. So unfortunately, the, the 2022s and the last year, the 2021s, this system is clogged up a teeny bit currently because some of these girls are, are instituting their year of eligibility. Oh, wow. Okay. So right now, currently, it's a, it's a little bit messy um, for those recruits that are coming out and graduating currently and probably within the next year. Um, hopefully that cleans up. Right. Um, but that's just unfortunate situation based on, on the pandemic piece. 
since 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 there's a backlog of recruits, let's say now, yeah. what advice would you give those people who are kind of stuck in the, in that kind of clog? I think they they have to be willing to negotiate a little bit um, because if they would really like to be recruited by that institution, they may have to be creative for the first year. So for example, if that institution does not have a scholarship available to give in mm-hmm. this particular case, then they may have to negotiate, okay, if I don't get it this year, can I get it the following year? So you, there, there's going to need to be some give and take a little bit. If that is the institution, if they want you and you want them, then there's probably going to need to be some give and take. Otherwise, you could find yourself out in the cold a little bit because um, there's just not going to be quite as much money being dished out. You know? And unfortunately, that is each school's uh, unique situation, meaning that they have to basically figure out whether the senior is coming back for a graduate degree or whether they're freeing that up for a new recruit. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. guys, listen to advice if you're stuck right now as a player. Keep being um, persistent, right? Okay, right. Keep, keep calling the coach and seeing what you got for me, what you got for me, yeah. and then say, what can I do for you to help your situation? Yeah. Um, so in the past, I want to say 10 plus years, um, I feel like there's been a lot more recruits that have been coming in from overseas. Um, why is that? Well, um, I think it's really the competitiveness. It's the competitiveness. So, you know, there's approximately 300 Division I institutions. So the, the question is, comes down to whether you can provide an entire roster of those 300 um, at every Division I institution. Mm-hmm. At some level, there's going to be some that are going to be left out in the cold as far as competitiveness. So drawing from a larger pool of people and the, you know, that is probably where it comes from. Meaning if you go international a little bit, you're going to be able to draw from a larger pool of people and make your program a bit more competitive. And this, obviously, there's a balancing act here. Um, And it's a very, I would say, a little bit of a touchy subject because as you have described, there has been, you know, foreign recruiting and there are some institutions that have, you know, almost full rosters this way. Right. Um, I've seen that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. For us, it's, 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 you know, in the city of San Francisco, obviously, there is some um, advantage being in a, in a very international city. Um, so we have had international recruits, but we also have, have made a strong push for domestic recruiting. Um, and that's us getting around and being proactive at the different tournaments and showcases that the United States has. Um, and then being able to identify what, what athletes from the United States, in a sense, would like to come to our institution. And that, that's going to be a process that we continue with. Um, will there be still some foreign athletes that, that come into our program? Most likely that's the case. Um, that's but that's true. where it's born from. Yeah. Got it, got it. Now, um, just a quick side note on the overseas recruiting. Mm-hmm. Um, do you believe that the overseas recruits have, let's say, a better, better match play, better... Uh, let's say maturity in tennis, just because they're playing higher levels of um, tournaments there. There is some arguments for some of that. Yep, there is some arguments for the, the fact that you may be getting into some of the ITF players that could be playing in, in multiple countries against a variety of different styles and different surfaces. Um, you know, versus just one surface. Um, and localized uh, tournament play here. Um, so there is some of that. I think you also, un- unfortunately, you have, a- as a culture, very similar to, you know, American soccer, you have a culture of, um, you know, if, if uh, where, you know, unfortunately, our sport is still, unfortunately, listed on the back page in the United right. States. Right. It's, it's not a forefront sport in our country. However, if I go to some countries, tennis is much closer to the top. Um, so exactly. there's a bigger priority sometimes for, for that development. And those are unfortunately uncomfortable answers, but those are probably the truth in some of the cases. Right. Because you have, you know, we have kids playing kids, you know, even at the highest levels like Easter Bowl 
and the Orange Bowl, right? But you're just kind of domestically playing each other in the same age groups. Whereas in Europe, I mean, they're playing ITF tournaments. They're playing like people who were on tour who could have been either has-beens or rehabbing. So they're playing at a much more higher level. So that's why I asked Peter that question. It, it um, can be that case, you know. Obviously, it's it's we have some amazing, you know, American tennis players here as well. Just going down and watching the the girls, um, 16, 18s at the hard courts, we got some great great players as well. So it's you know it's a it's you just have to find the best fit for your program. Um, and like I said, um, for us, it really. It's it's going to be definitely a group of Americans, but at the same time we, we may have a few foreign players that come in right. as well. All right, so um, I know a bunch of viewers have asked this question now. Does producing a YouTube video on recruiting yourself does that help your cause? It does help your cause. Yes, and you know. This year was a perfect example of it. Okay, so the, the rules, the, <laughs> the rules basically shut us down from travel and in-person identification. So basically, this year was the epitome of um, all we could do. Basically, was watch video, right? Um, and the showcases that we, um, you know, had to watch a lot of times, they had to kind of get their act together and make sure that they were streaming those matches so that we could watch. Um, that obviously can be put down into a YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, you also, with your coach or um, academy friends, can can create these. And again, you know, like we said, recruitment is a job interview. It's it's a sales piece. On our end, we're selling the university. On their end, they're selling themselves to us. If if you would like to get that raw, and. And that's what job interviewing is all about. Right. And they're trying to provide us with, you know, a convincing argument of why we should take them onto the team in that particular case. Video helps. It is not the end all be all. That's not an ideal situation. So obviously this year was not an ideal recruitment year. Um, but in a lot of the cases, as I mentioned, you hopefully have seen some of those players, an example for some of the recruits that came in this year. Fortunately, I had already seen those players in the 16s and as they were 16 and 17 year olds play live okay. at the various tournaments in the United States. Um, so I've already, I had already seen them. Then this last year, sure, they're providing me updates on YouTube and some of their match play. So I'm, I'm still feeling comfortable with the process that, okay, I've seen you play live, but I also get to see some updates on video. Um, we're trying to get away from just obviously some of the pure video recruitment right. pieces. Um, yeah. So, so basically, um, in a job interview, just in case you're young and don't know yet, um, there's processes to that. You know, even in your job, like, like what I'm talking about is a job interview. Uh, there's the initial interview. Sometimes there's a second interview with somebody else that's different. And then a third interview would be potentially your bosses. So um, HR first, you know, somebody else who might be in the same position as you would be, like maybe a different player from that team. And then the final interview would maybe be Peter Bartlett. So we need three times to see you sometimes to kind of figure out the real you. Right? Yeah, that right. is a great... Yes, great depiction of it. And, you know, our, my, my assistant coach, Coach Dizan, he likes to say this because I think that is part of what we're doing. You know, we are, you're there, you know, and it goes both ways. Obviously, for us, we're trying to tell you how great our university is and all the things that, that uh, can happen if you come to our university. Um, so it goes both ways. But you have to get to know us. We have to get to know you. And like Harry, like you stated, it is a process, and that process usually wants to take on, um, you know, various situations that you're in, us watching you play, um, us talking to you, talking to your parents, um, you coming and visiting, uh, you meeting the players on the team, you meeting administrators, you kind of researching what we have to offer outside of, in a sense, what the coach tells you as well. 
which again, as you know, is part of a good interview process as well. Right. Um, yeah. So co when Coach uh, Coach Peter is talking about the whole process, is you're basically going to be part of a tennis and university culture that they would welcome you in as a family member because you guys got to remember we got to live with you for four years you got to live with us for four years so we want to make sure that we want you for four years and you want us for four years yes so uh, we want to make sure we all going to get along and we understand each other through that time and hopefully it's the best time of your life. Um, so, Coach Peter, um, we're going through the process now. You like the recruit. The recruit likes you. Is there anything that the recruit should know? I mean, are you pretty much um, an open book at this, um, at this standpoint or at this juncture where it's like, okay, we like each other. We've gone through a lot of the processes. Um, at what point do we say, hey, we want you and you want us? Yeah. That's going to be relative. Each year will be unique. Okay. It sometimes can come down to, you know, in a sense, there is a list that, that, that obviously, if I were to put it bluntly, that you're creating and you're trying to figure out what your needs really are. Um, and that can have a little bit to do with how talented the player is, whether you feel like how good that fit really is. If that ends up being a really good fit really early and we know what that process looks like, we're very comfortable with it, then you have what's called a verbal commitment. Okay, And a verbal commitment, in a sense, is when I've agreed to commit, in a sense, that offer, and that could be a scholarship offer, um, verbally just saying, hey, you know, we've got a scholarship, it's it's going to be available potentially, and you would then be committing in a sense verbally saying, okay, I would like to go to your university. At that point in that verbal, what the unwritten rules are is that um, you're going to then stop your recruiting process and commit to our university. Mm -hmm. That in a sense, and obviously out of word, I'm going to say I have a spot for you um, and we're gonna make this verbal agreement. And that process can happen pretty early, okay? Um, then what ends up happening is as they move into their senior year, into that fall period, there's then the solidification of that agreement in the form of a national letter of intent, okay? And that happens again in the process later into the fall, in the November, where that player can then sign paperwork, um, a national letter of intent with the scholarship agreement, in a sense, early signing for the university. And that's where that process gets solidified. The verbaling is basically these, these agreements, right? Now, when I say that, obviously you, you have a reputation and they have a reputation as well. Mm -hmm. You're trying to keep your word. They're trying to keep their word. Has that always gone super smooth? I'm sure there's some universities where it hasn't. In our particular case, that's, that's our word. That's their word. We've been very straightforward with that athlete communicating with them. But that's the way that early process goes. Um, and then it gets solidified with the paperwork and the, the, the agreements through the NCAA um, and the compliance department in that November period. So, so <clears throat> tennis, like most other sports, um, go through the same. So verbal for agreement, right? And then you go through, when you get into your senior year, you, there's a, like, you know, it's kind of like football, basketball, you know, you, you get the cap right in front of you, you get the paperwork in front of you, and then you sign Correct. the official agreement that you are going to be a player for Coach Peter here. So just like on TV, when you watch those high school kids sign up for basketball or football, they do the same for tennis. Yes. Yep. Perfect. And we try to, and obviously in this world of social media, once those things have been signed and compliance signs off on it and everybody's seen the paperwork then similar you can begin to to, to use the press uh, right. or the instagrams or there things like go. that to, to get that process solidified as well right. perfect yeah. now what or how big um does grades fall into this 
um, they, they fall into the category of obviously for us, um, it's, it's always been one of those things. If, if, if our program isn't going to win the national championship that year or what have you, the athletic director and, and the university is always looking for, okay, well, what else, what else does your program do well? Right? Well, we would like our athletes to represent the university in this, in this great manner. Um, and grades are part of that. You learning and studying at the university is a, is a high priority for our program. So that is a very important thing. We historically have had, um, you know, one of the stronger GPAs in the athletic department. Um, and that really is something that, that gets pushed um, at the athletic department level, but also from the coaching staff and, and what we really uh, tell our team about. If for any reason things are, are not going in that direction, we have resources that can help with tutoring and things like this. So that's definitely something that we take some pride in. Um, you know, you can get awards that are at the, the conference level for academics. You can get awards at the ITA level for academics. Um, and then obviously at the university, you have various clubs. You also have awards there. So this is one of those things that, um, yeah, we take some pride in the, the academics of our team. Um, definitely. Got it. So, yeah. mo I mean, most tennis players are s pretty smart. I think that, that in general, if you were to really just, you know, look at what those GPAs look like, I would agree with you. I would say that they're, that most have, have crossed those T's. Most are, in a sense, paying attention to the academics. I would agree with you. So I'm going to ask Coach um, Coach Peter an interesting question here that now that, that just got spurred on in my head. Would you take a bunch of morons on your team that barely have a 2.0 but win a national championship in tennis? Well, I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the, that is a big balancing act. And I think every program has to kind of figure out what that equation is have you know is it the point where we've we've got all 4.0s and we've got no that answer is probably not it's not but uh you have to also balance what what you're getting yourself into right. can you have a whole bunch of that you probably can't your culture on your team has to be good enough to really contain any of the pieces that 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 don't fit within that right. and maybe it is that that you know that that individual you know, is trying hard. They're they they are, they're working the best they can, but they might need a little bit of help. Right. So you you have to make that judgment a little bit, and that's a team per team thing. Obviously, in the ideal world, you're really trying to get those ones that qualify the best, because as you know, you could be super talented, but if you're a headache the entire four years for for the coach, right. um, you also have you know, metrics on our program that that um, you know incentivize having good academics so you don't want that to drop too low you know yeah, yeah. um so you you got to make those those judgment calls i think as a coach and uh yeah just, just for kids yeah. just for kids yes and i love nick curios okay guys I, just, <laughs> I love nick curios if you could have six nick curios <laughs> on your team would you do it well i think the question is whether the university would accept <laughs> that as well but <laughs> yeah um because again when when you do have somebody that is is below some of those, if, if you know, I don't want to put Nick in that that category because he could be brilliant in the classroom. Right. No offense, Nick. But the reality to it, if you have somebody that is below those in those categories, you you're getting a, a little bit of a you know a, a card. You you've got to kind of ask, okay, is this going to work for the program? There are certain standards that the athletic de department has, that the university has. Um, you know, so yeah, you got six like, wild cards, you know? Like, yeah. It's a, it's you, you, a could use a <laughs> you could use a couple wild cards. You could use a couple wild cards. I'm not sure I can go all six. That would be, that, that would be tough. Thank you you got to be a master manager, <laughs> master manager. Exactly. To pull that one all Master handholder for all six <laughs> exactly. of them. Yeah. Okay. So you've been in the unique position of recruiting both men and women to your programs. Um, are there differences? I wouldn't say that there are differences. The pro, the actual process is, is really, um, is, is similar. There, there are a little differences in the sense of, of development pieces. Um, and what we mean by that, and it's very similar to, to the way in which you see at the WTA or the ATP, you do see maturity levels a little higher with the, with the females. Mm -hmm. That's physical maturity. That could be also a little bit of mental maturity. Definitely they may be ready. Maturity. Yeah. 
they may be more ready. So you're looking at them and identifying them as I, I kind of just mentioned to you. There's some 16 year olds down there that I watch that, that, that are pretty close to being ready to go. Right mm -hmm. now, sure, they're going to benefit from a couple more years, but physically they've developed mentally. They have their act together, things like that. So there is, if that's the case, then it means I got to get out there a little bit earlier. I've also had it on the men's side where I've had a late bloomer. That, that, that kid's a zoo there. He's a zoo for, you know, sophomore and junior year. And then all of a sudden it, it clears up. He all of a sudden adds a little bit of muscle to himself. And all of a sudden now I got a kid that, that can play, but I don't really know that until his senior year. So there's this latency. Okay. It's, it's one of the reasons that you, that you have higher rates of, of men going again into that, that category when we talk about um, who's in the top 100 right now of WTA versus ATP. Right. It's the same same equation here. So for me, when I did get into, uh, on the women's side, identifying the girls a little bit earlier, they also are a little bit earlier to have that interaction and know a bit more what they want. So that's one of the differences, I would say. Sure. Um, then you're really just individually looking at the athlete, just saying, okay, what, what do they care about? Okay. So that obviously can be asking those questions. What do they care about? What do they care about? Is it, is it something in the city? Is it the academics? Is it the, the tennis? Is it the culture? It, you know, so then you're really going individual with each athlete. That really doesn't fall too much into gender. Um, um, but I would say that if there are some small differences, you got to be a bit more organized, I think, because you got to be ready. Uh, a little bit more on the women's side. That's been my experience. Got it. I mean, it just in in gender, uh, women develop faster. Uh, they mature faster. So you know, Coach Bartlett is right. You know, the you get a more mature woman who I don't want to say is easier to coach, but they're kind of more ready and refined. Whereas. You know, I was a stupid boy once, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are stupid boys. Um, at 16, you're probably 12 in the mind, you know. So uh, maybe physically you develop, but mentally you're not quite there yet. So if you guys know what I'm talking about, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, this phenomena, you know, this is why you have a, a, a Sam Query, why you had a Jack Sock who up until their very senior year, mm -hmm. am I going pro or am I going over to one of the, the top universities? Right. right. And there's that balance again. That's why you have a, somebody like a CC Bellis who freshman year, I mean, the girl's winning main draws at the U S open. Right. right. Um, so there is some difference there that there is a ready to go ness. And then there's a little bit of a latency. You, you have to be ready as a coach. You got to be ready for a little bit more of that. So I'd say if there is a little bit difference, um, yeah. So, uh, Query went to college, guys. He needed that four more years. No, to no, Query did not. Did he didn't go to college? No. Uh, Isner did. Isner did, yeah. But okay. Sam Query went straight to the pros, but it was, again, that's that period where it was rumored he was going to go. And the uh -huh. same with Jack. Was he going to go? Was he going to go? Who right. went to USC? Was it Query? No, no it was Stevie Johnson. Stevie Johnson. Stevie that's Johnson. what was in my mind. Yeah. Got it. And, you know, and Stevie was a great example. Stevie was not that player as a junior. He was getting talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. So when he went to USC, he wasn't the Stevie Johnson. He developed into the Stevie Johnson when he got there by maturity, by a lot of experiences. And then again, obviously as, as rock star status towards that junior and senior year. Right. Um, but after that, after that freshman year, that, that took, you know, we didn't, I'm sure they didn't know what they had. They had some potential, but that's a good example. So yeah, Stevie Johnson went to USC four years, graduated, yeah. and then went pro. Yeah. Um, CC Bellis uh, committed to Stanford. Uh, I don't know if she actually walked on campus. I'm not sure. Obviously, she lived in that backyard, <laughs> right? Um, so she was well aware of what that process was, and she held out until the very last moment to kind of again, what what am I doing? And they just made a decision for their for their her situation, right? Um, but again, like like what Coach was saying. She was in the U.S. Open draw, so she ready to go. Uh, so that's that's the difference. Yep, she was ready to go. Okay, so what can potential recruits um, do? I mean, do they ever contact you and say, 
hey, I'm going to be at the Easter Bowl. Um, I'm not seated, but I'm in the draw. Um, if you have time when you're there, uh, maybe take a gander at me. Yes, so all of the above. The process really should look like this. There should be some form of, in a sense, identifying, okay, I'm going to be at a showcase. I would, I personally would, would think that, that each athlete should put together an email. Um, and in that email, that's a letter of introduction, um, telling the coach exactly what you're all about. Um, that's where also, if you do have that YouTube video, you're attaching that. Right. Okay. Um, and then what it really ends up being is trying to get some form of contact. Okay. And this is where I, I think persistent is going to be the biggest key here. These coaches are all very busy. If I were to just tell you the volume of letters I get, it, it could be up to 30 to 50 recruitment letters a day, a day. Wow. So that, and that depends on the cycle of year, you know, what time of the year. Um, in addition to that, some of, some of those processes. So be persistent. If, if the, the coach doesn't respond, hit that, hit that send button again, try to get the contact. And if it's not the head coach, go to the assistant, go to the volunteer. The volunteer may, may not be involved in the, the process, the recruitment process, but go to anyone that you can because they can always forward it to whoever is. Okay. So that would be a really important one. Then from there, once you've got a little bit of contact and maybe even regardless, if you don't, Give some updates. Tell us, okay, just what you said. Hey, coach, I'm going to be at this tournament. Is it, are you going to be there? Is there any way for you to take a look at me? Mm -hmm. So I would say that those are definitely things that I, I think that proactiveness is a really important piece. Okay, And I'm going to now, as we just said, the difference, as we said, between foreign okay, and domestic. And I, I've been in the game for, for a long time. And I, I am going to be uh, just very obvious. Some things have changed over that period of time. But in general, foreign athletes send way more emails than domestic athletes. Okay, bottom line. Okay, I, I, I rarely, and this has been periods of time throughout my career, I rarely would get domestic athletes sending me letters. Here's the reason why. They believe that I should go get on that plane go take the, the, the drive and go see them. Mm. Okay. And there is, there historically has been a little bit of, of that, like come see me, come knock on my door for coach and versus the, the foreign athlete. I hate to tell you, but is just clawing for an opportunity to get in. They're just looking for a crack in the door. So they're sending a lot more contact letters. Okay. So if I was a domestic athlete, I would be on that train. I would be sending, um, and, and what ends up happening is sometimes they think, you know, tennis recruiting or all these other services are doing these things for them. If, if you would like it to be in your control, then you should be the one that sends it, not mom or dad, not your coach. Okay. So be involved in that process. Okay. Because that's also what ends up happening on the foreign side. Keep in mind that foreign player, their parents probably don't even speak English. So I know it's the athlete that's making the contact. In the domestic side, I don't know if mom or dad wrote the letter, and I don't know if some coach wrote the letter. So try to make it be you. Try to get involved in that process. That's going to educate the process, and try to be proactive and persistent. Wow. I, I'm kind of shocked by that because, I mean, you figure everybody's on social media. Um, they're constantly typing, doing something, uh, that, and you – play tennis, obviously, and you want to get people's attention that, you know, potentially you want to play for a certain coach, you would think that they would be more proactive about this whole thing. So just like what Peter said, guys, you know, if you're hungry and you want to play, um, I know as much as coach wants that hundred emails a day, I mean, you guys have to tell him that you're also interested in wanting to play for him. So don't be shy. You know, I know Americans tend to be shy and you know, go like this all the time on the phone, but uh, be persistent. Yeah, and I think it's, it's you know, create that list. Create, okay, I want to go here, I want to go here, and just and, and start to, to get that process down. Keep, keep clicking and sending. That's going to be 
you know, your best. I think, again, there's this wait and see process, um, or it's this process where mom or dad tells them, hey, you got to go do this. Mm, that can be. So again, if you want it, if you would like to go to that program and that's the program that you know and that university, then try to be proactive with it. And if, if you are not in the category of high, high, okay, you're not the five star, but maybe you're a four star, maybe you're a budding three star, try to think of some things, that, let's get creative here, that, that get some attention for you, okay? Because everybody might be looking at the five star, but you, if you've got this potential, put some things down on that, that email, um, get me something that's creative, that's unique about you. Okay. And so you got to look at those intangibles, which are the things that just don't define exactly the ranking, the UTR. There's got to be things outside of that because we will look at that, but we got to get the attention. So you're telling me and you're telling them yeah. that W's aren't the be all and end all. I'm telling you, you know, right now I would say that UTR piece, you know, everybody just looks at the UTR. Everybody just looks at the UTR. The kids get focused on it. The right. coaches get sometimes too focused. But outside of that, you know, this year, once again, is a very good year. The UTR system, unfortunately, has been killed by the pandemic. No offense to UTR. They're doing the best they can. But that that whole thing dropped a lot of girls' UTRs. So there's a lot of girls down down here, and maybe in, in this world, they're, they're in a high 8 category. Maybe they're in a low 9 category. And they were up in the high nines. Well, now they're, they're looking at a lower UTR. So their, their interest level from that university they might have originally been looking at or that university is are starting to wane. Mm. Okay. And, and that's only if they don't, again, explain the situation, get a little bit of the intangibles and say, Hey, you know, and get that contact going because they've got to be able to explain out a little bit of that. Wins, obviously, we, we, we do want the kids winning, but we also know it's a growth period. I mean, there's, there's girls that are working on their game. They're working on things within their game. So that's, that's a constant process. You, you just want to get that contact going and that relationship going. Okay. So you, you mentioned UTR. Yeah. Um, what would be the minimal UTR that you would look at on a woman? In a minimal on a man. That, that's going to be relative. That's going to be relative to each program. We have our metrics. Mm -hmm. We have our own metrics mm -hmm. that we have identified, um, and we've tried to move those metrics up. We currently, this last season, we we're a nationally ranked program. Right. Okay. Now, um, so yes, those metrics are now going to bump. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to to just stay where I'm at. Right. Right. And so. That's going to be relative to, you know, every coach is going to kind of have that little bar on, on the UTR. Got Obviously it. for, for division one, you want to be, you know, you want to be eights and above, but obviously we, we all know that the best programs in the country have a high 10 or an 11. And we're not going to be able to get all those girls distributed to, to all the universities. So that's where development comes in. And, and we're, we're in that space. Okay. We're, if I were to describe my program, it's, it's taking the four star and creating five stars. I've probably done that the most okay. because the five star, unfortunately, is sitting on, on a larger roster. Okay. At a larger university sometimes, sometimes for a good reason, sometimes for not a good reason. There's right. probably a lot of kids that are playing seven, eight, nine, ten down on those rosters, but they're not going anywhere because they just wanted to say the university's name. Exactly. Right. So we're stuck a little bit more with development pieces um, and that potential four star. We do have recruited five stars, so it doesn't mean we're not. And I would say that we are starting to move in that direction just because we we starting to get a number next to our name. So we're getting more attention from that level. But we're our coaches are geared towards development. That's the bottom line. Um, we'll take that person that's very hungry, has a little bit of potential. And, and start to work hard on what their game is and their development. Yeah. Okay. Um, so any final words of wisdom for our viewers out there? Yeah, I, you know, I think it really is a little bit of what we said. I would say the persistence piece is, is a big one. If you're looking to be recruited uh, for college, I would say identify, again, what level you really feel you're, you're at, and what are those things that you would like to have. So make that list. Make the list. That's a super important thing. Make the list of, you know, do I want to be in a, a urban or rural situation? Mm -hmm. Do I want it to be high academic? Do I want the team to be, 
you know, a, a team, a group. Uh, I want that culture to be good, right? What about the coaches? Do they have enough experience to coach you? You know, so you got to ask all these kind of tough questions. Um, and I think you've got to really figure out what that is and then get to know those coaches and those coaching staff. So be proactive. That would be super, be proactive and be persistent. That to me is two things that, um, you know, and try to be that person that doesn't take the no until it's really a no, no, no. So get in there and, and do your work um, if you would like that attention, because I think it's going to pay out. So guys, work hard, work hard at a young age, keep your grades up, be persistent, um, you know, make that list like Coach Peter said, okay, and make contact via email, via letter, right? Call. 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 Wow. Okay. Yeah. Nobody uses that phone anymore. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> okay. You can do anything that you need to get some attention. There. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, get that attention for yourself. If yeah. that is, you know, if USF is the place where you want to go, um, Coach Peter is right here. Uh, San Francisco is a great place. Um, I want to thank Coach Peter. Thank for, you for having me. Yeah. Th thank you for doing this with me. I've been wanting to do this for a while, and I'm, and I'm happy that you, know, you actually made some time for this. So, guys, uh, thank you for watching Tennis Spin, Tennis where spin. we put our spin on your tennis.